and start my screen share. Where is PowerPoint? There it is. Okay, um, looking ahead, this is our kind of second to last full week of class. Um, so today and Wednesday and then next Monday, um, those are the last three lectures of uh, new content. So the last three lectures of stuff that'll be on the final exam, basically. Um, Wednesday of next week, I'll do kind of a little summary slash review type lecture. You can check how much biomechanics you learned this semester. Um, Monday, the 11th of May, so Monday, two weeks from now, is, is technically a day of class, but we don't have anything uh, scheduled for that uh, for that Monday. I like to keep a, a day free um, at the end of the semester in case there's any unexpected uh, closures or cancellations or, or whatever. So uh, nothing for uh, the Monday of, of May 11th. So three more lectures coming up here, um, and then uh, a summary next week, and then that will be it for content as far as, as this course goes. Um, last time we started into kind of our final section of class, which is just some general applications of uh, biomechanics for explaining uh, human health and human performance. Um, talked about aging and health and injury. So covered quite a bit of content last time and lots of different topics. Um, talked about some preventable versus inevitable changes in gait with aging. Um, we all kind of know whether, we, whether we're aware of it or not, the stereotypical uh, gait mechanics that we kind of prescribe to older adults, the kind of hunched over, you know, shuffling kind of shorter, quicker steps type gait that we often attribute to um, aging. Um, some of those mechanics do indeed happen with aging unavoidably, even if you're like a really healthy, really fit, really physically active older adult. Uh, but many of them don't. There are elements of aging, such as the uh, preference for a, a slower walking speed that don't necessarily appear to be inevitable consequences of aging. They may be consequences of the tendency to uh, be less fit and less physically active as you age. And you can maintain, uh, at least in some aspects, a, a youthful type uh, a walking mechanics if you uh, maintain a high level of fitness and, and physical activity um, as you age. So if you're exercising a lot right now, that's great. Keep it up and keep it up into your older years and you will uh, benefit from this for, for not just for biomechanics, but for a, a wide variety of reasons. Uh, general good predictor of future disability and mortality along those lines. Uh, walking speed is what we talked about last time primarily. Um, that's not to say like if an older adult walks slow that they should deliberately try to start walking faster and this will help them. Um, if, they, if somebody prefers to walk slow and tries to walk fast intentionally, then that, that could be a bad thing. That could lead to you know, imbalance and falls and things like that. Um, what this notion that slow walking speed is predictive of disability and mortality is saying is that that can be an early indicator of some uh, yet undiagnosed underlying issue or underlying condition. So it could be an indicator of, of some problem elsewhere on the body uh, by looking at the simple mechanical variable of walking speed. Um, if you're interested in other things that are simple tests that are indicative of you know, general mobility in older adults or even in younger adults, and uh, possible future disability and, and mortality, unfortunately, in older adults. Um, hand grip strength, like how much force you can generate grabbing something, um, correlates fairly well with overall kind of whole body muscle strength. So that's that's a test that gets looked at. Um, this last one here is one that I like rising from the floor. So try, try this out on your own and see if you can, as a young adult, can actually do this. I, I can do it on my left leg, but can't do it on my right leg. I guess I have some imbalance there. Um, but if you sit on the floor, are you able to get up off of the floor using just your legs and not, not relying on your arms? So don't use your arms to push yourself from the floor, but sit on the floor and use just your legs to stand up. That's, that's a good predictor of, uh, of future uh, disability and, and, and longevity, uh, especially in older adults. Um, also covered uh, running biomechanics and injury last time. So does the way that somebody runs in terms of their mechanics um, present a risk for injury in terms of running? Um, there's a general weak role for biomechanics in overall causal relationships for running injuries, like if we lump all injuries together. And that's kind of expected, right? There's no reason to expect that all injuries have any biomechanics component at all, or that they all, if they all have a component, that it's the same component. Um, if you start looking at specific injuries, like just at stress fractures of the tibia or just at uh, iliotibial band syndrome or something to, to that, you know, a very specific injury to a very specific part of the body in runners, then we see some stronger roles for biomechanics and some more consistent results there in terms of uh, characteristics or signatures of the way somebody runs that might be associated uh, with certain injuries. 
Okay, today we will continue uh, with the uh, theme on kind of sports that we talked about, uh, that we, uh, we focused on a little bit last time with the running, and uh, talk here about uh, biomechanics in the performance of athletics type motions. Um, if you're thinking about uh, taking Kines 402 someday, which is the sport biomechanics class I teach for students after taking this one, um, we don't focus just on jumping biomechanics in that class, it's about sports in general, uh, but the lecture today is a good example of the type of things that we focus on in, in the semester long course in, in Kines 402. So today we will talk about what biomechanics can teach us and tell us about performance and specifically we'll, we'll use the framework for performance here as performance in uh, vertical jumping and trying to jump uh, for maximum height as high as you can in terms of what's the best technique for that um, and then related to that uh, what's the best way to train for increasing your jumping ability to increase the height uh, that you're able to jump to and and, and what's the biomechanical or the the the, uh, the kind of muscle level perspective or muscle level basis for for that training so first things first, what's the best way to jump, to jump as high as possible? Um, if you're watching this lecture recorded or if you're watching it live, I'll give you a minute here to test this out. Make, make sure you do it in a place that has a high enough ceiling to not hit your head on it. Um, but we already did an experiment on this earlier in the semester to see what, what technique do people kind of naturally use to jump as high as they can. So take a second here while you're watching this and you don't even have to jump as high as you can, just do a jump and pay attention to the mechanics that you use to do that jump. Um, I would wager that everybody that does that, or at least most of you that do that, would do what's called in uh, the jumping uh, in literature um, a counter movement jump. Now that's this jump that's over here on the right that you see the, the subject doing here, where they start in an upright posture here. And then when they start the, the jumping action, they dynamically squat down here into this squatted posture and then dynamically jump back up off the ground. So you start upright here and then dynamically squat down, flexing your trunk and flexing all your joints, and then push your legs against the ground to rise up and jump. Um, the other type of jump that's commonly studied in biomechanics, because it's also commonly done in sports, is this one over here, a squat jump. And so you can think of kind of the difference between these two types of jumps, a squat jump and a counter movement jump, as whether it's a static squat that you start with on the left, or whether it's a dynamic squat that you start with on the right. Here in the counter movement, I'm doing a dynamic squat. I squat down dynamically and then push off. Here with the squat jump, I squat down and hold that static squat for a while and then push my legs against the ground. So I skip the counter movement part of the jump and just do the push off part of the jump in the squat jump here. Um, which technique makes you jump higher? Um, indisputably, it's the counter movement jump that makes you jump higher. Um, and that, you know, that, that's the kind of thing I don't like in this class. That's just a fact to memorize. So a counter movement jump jumps higher than squat jump. It's more interesting to ask, why does the counter movement jump jump higher than the squat jump? Why do we reach greater jump heights with the same body doing the counter movement technique versus the squat jump technique? Um, also notice here that in both of these cases, the, the jumper here is holding their arms above their head, okay? Um, when you yourself try to jump for maximum height, you probably don't do that, right? You probably swing your arms along with doing the counter movement to jump for maximum height. Okay? Um, so this person here, because they're comparing the squat jump and the counter movement, they're controlling for that arm effect because the arm swing can have an effect on how high you jump. So we'll also uh, cover a little bit of that today, arm swing and jumping. But indisputably, performing the counter movement jump with the dynamic start on the left here, makes you jump higher than if you perform a squat jump here with this static start on the right here. And again, what I'm getting at here with this dynamic start versus static start, with the counter movement jump, I start straight up and down and then dynamically do a squat. With the squat jump, I start statically in that squatted posture and hold it there and then push off against the ground like that. And you can see you jump higher here with the dynamic start, this counter movement jump versus the squat start, or the, the static start here with the squat jump. So that counter movement technique is indisputably the best way to maximize your jump height. But again, that's not terribly interesting. That's just a fact to memorize. The, the interesting biomechanics come in when we say why or ask why is it better to do the uh, counter movement jump than versus the squat jump if you want to jump for max height. And what about the role of arm swing there? What's, what, what, what role does arm swing play in making me reach a, a higher jump height than if I did either of those jumps without swinging my arms? So let's see if we can examine those things and, and get some uh, compelling and interesting answers to these questions. Now, we previously talked about um, peak jump height. And this was quite a while ago. This uh, title here says from last class. This was from actually many classes ago back when we were talking about ground reaction forces. Um, the peak jump height, the peak height that you get to during a jump 
is essentially dictated by the velocity that you leave the ground at, which is essentially dictated by the vertical impulse, the area under your force time curve, the area under that vertical force under your feet as a function of time when you're jumping. Okay? So the simple kind of mechanics explanation for why the counter movement jump gets to a greater jump height is that, well, it must generate a greater takeoff velocity. Mechanically, that's the only way that it could reach a greater height. And mechanically, the only way it can have a greater takeoff velocity is by generating a greater vertical impulse against the ground. Okay. So this is kind of the center of mass whole body level explanation for why a counter movement jump jumps to a greater height than a squat jump. Um, we could also extend this answer to explaining why arm swing gets to a greater jump height. The only mechanical way that it could possibly do that at the level of, of the whole body of the center of mass would be if arm swing somehow increases vertical takeoff velocity, which means it must have also increased the vertical impulse under your feet um, while you were jumping. Um, I would again say, and, and this, this is uh, just the math of how that actually works out. Um, here's the trace of my force under my feet, this blue line while I'm doing a uh, counter movement jump here. And so you can see it starts at my body weight when I'm just standing there. And then when I do my counter movement, it goes a little bit below my body weight and then back up as I start pressing my feet into the ground. Okay. Then suddenly it drops from this peak real quickly to zero. And what would be happening here at this first kind of drop to zero is that's when my feet leave the ground. Okay. So for this time here where my force is um, zero, that's, that's the airborne phase. This is when I'm actually in the air jumping. Okay. And then here my feet hit the ground, I slam into the ground and land and get this big spike in force there from that impact of that landing. And then settle back into to body weight here as, as I recover uh, from that landing. Okay. So we can apply here this impulse momentum relationship from earlier in class. I say I have this force under my feet and it's applied for a certain amount of time here. And that force that's applied for this certain amount of time, this force time integral here, the area under this blue part of the curve up until I take off here is gonna be equal to the change in momentum of my body's mass while I'm performing that jump, okay? My mass isn't changing much. So it's gonna be mass times my change in vertical velocity. My vertical velocity here when I start moving compared to my vertical velocity here at time three there when I push off the ground. Okay. I can take that equation and I can rearrange it and solve for my takeoff velocity there. And I can see that my takeoff velocity is equal to my impulse there divided by my mass there. Okay. So the only way to get to a greater jump height is to have a greater or a faster takeoff velocity, which is a direct function of the impulse of the area under this force time curve while you're jumping. Okay. So that's kind of the simple answer. And then the, the, you know, the English answer on the previous slide and the mathematics answer on this slide for why necessarily the counter, what must be going on mechanically at the whole body level when a counter movement jump produces a greater jump height. It's gotta be generating a greater takeoff velocity, which means it has to be generating a greater uh, impulse, a larger force time integral under your feet here while you're performing the jump on, on the ground with your feet on the ground and generating that impulse. Okay? Um, and that must also necessarily be the answer for arm swing. Arm swing must also be increasing that takeoff velocity, um, which means it must be increasing this impulse here. Okay? Um, again, I would say though, that's not a very interesting, satisfactory answer, right? If you say, well, just take off from the ground faster, just generate greater impulse, well, how? Like, how do I do that, right? Um, greater takeoff velocity. I don't even know where to begin to tell you how to do that. Train, I guess, you know, get stronger. But like mechanically, how do I move my body in a way that makes that bigger? I'm, I'm not sure. That's a tough question. Um, if I look at the impulse there, then I can get a little bit closer idea, right? Impulse can be increased by increasing this force F, you know, so generate just larger average forces here. Or it could be increased by increasing this amount of time here, right? Maybe the way to jump higher is to just simply generate force on the ground and spend more time on the ground so that your impulse is a little bit bigger and you get a little bit faster takeoff velocity. Okay, so we can kind of get some ideas here of what, what we might have to do more specifically to jump higher or why more specifically or more interestingly things like counter movements and things like arm swing make us jump higher. So just to summarize, if you wanna to get to a peak jump or whether you're doing an arm swing or not, whether you're doing a counter movement or not, that peak height is gonna be determined by your takeoff velocity, which is gonna be determined by your vertical impulse against the ground. So to jump higher, you gotta have a bigger impulse, which means you gotta generate a bigger takeoff velocity and thus a greater jump height. 
Um, but again, I don't think that's a very interesting or satisfactory answer. So let's see if we can figure out more specifically why the counter movement jump height jumps higher, or maybe another way of looking at that is the squat jump and why does it jump lower? Um, there's several theories in the jumping biomechanics literature on why specifically everybody jumps higher when they do a counter movement jump versus a squat jump. Um, those theories here are suboptimal coordination of the mechanics, um, more time for force development, and greater storage and return of elastic energy in the muscles of the, of the body and of the lower leg specifically. Um, just to give you some examples of these, what these mean in kind of plainer language, um, suboptimal coordination of mechanics here, this is getting at that idea that when I did my maximum height jump and when you guys did your maximum height jump, I'm guessing everybody did a counter movement. Okay, That's kind of just naturally, subjectively what we do when we're given this task of jumping as high as possible. Okay, Probably nobody on their own volition did a squat jump to jump as high as possible. That's kind of interesting, right? I, I like these things in, in human movement and in, in biomechanics and motor control, where you give people an instruction, you know, jump as high as you can, and you don't give them any other specifics. You don't say, by the way, swing your arms, or by the way, do a counter movement, or by the way, move your trunk, or move your arms, and move your legs like this. Everybody does kind of the same thing, though. Despite not being told to swing your arms, you probably all swung your arms. Despite not being told to do a counter movement, you probably all did a counter movement. Okay? So given that non-specific instruction or non-specific task, jump as high as possible, we all did specific things. We all probably swung our arms and we all probably did a counter movement. So that's kind of the familiar natural thing to do, right? When I'm going to try and jump as high as possible, whether I know it or not, I'm doing a counter movement. Um, the squat jump is kind of a more specialized jump, something that we don't do quite as often or that we don't have the intuition to do when we can do a counter movement jump. And so we're just not as good at it, not as practiced at it. And because of that lack of practice, maybe we just don't jump as high as we could. Or maybe if I practice squat jumps all the time, like frequently, maybe then I could jump a little bit higher and, and actually equal my counter movement jump height. Okay, so that's what that first one is getting at. Maybe we don't jump as high with squat jumps just because we're not as well practiced and familiar with them in terms of our movement control as we are with the counter movement jump. Uh, number two here is saying the counter movement jump is simply a longer movement, right? With the squat jump, I'm basically skipping that, that dipping down and that countering part. So simply because the movement takes longer, we have longer amounts of time with our feet against the ground to generate impulse longer amounts of time for our muscles to, to increase in force and produce lots of force and do lots of work on the body. So maybe it's just simply more time available uh, for all of these mechanics and the, these forces and, and work to develop and energy to develop when we do the longer movement, the counter movement. Um, the other, and then the third and final one here is this notion of when I squat down in that counter movement motion, I'm stretching all of the big main muscle groups of my body when I do that squatting motion. And let me stop my share here and make the screen big so you guys can kind of see what I'm getting at there. So like, like basically everything that involves like performance against gravity, like lifting the body up in the air against gravity, uh, whether it's supporting your body weight in, in walking or running or sprinting or whether it's uh, jumping, um, your main kind of movement or your main kind of muscles for doing that movement and resisting gravity are the big extensor muscle groups, the glutes, the quadriceps, and the, the calf muscles, the plantar flexors. So when I do this counter movement here, I start straight up and down, and then I counter down like that. And look at all three of the joints of my lower leg, the hips, the knees, and the ankles. When I'm doing that counter movement, I'm flexing my hips, which stretches my hip extensors, my glutes. I'm flexing my knees, which stretches my quadriceps, and I am dorsiflexing my ankles, which stretches my plantar flexors back there. So by doing that counter movement, let me get my screen share back up here. By doing that counter movement, I'm stretching all three of those main, you know, strong extensor muscle groups for then pushing my body against gravity at the bottom of that squat. And so it's stretching those muscles and storing elastic strain energy in them by stretching them that could then feasibly be released as kinetic energy, energy of motion of the body um, when I then push off the ground later on. And so perhaps we store more strain energy in those muscles uh, when we do the counter movement jump versus the squat jump. So let's examine each one of these theories in a little bit more detail and see if we can figure out which one, if any one or any ones in particular, is the most convincing and compelling reason for why people jump higher uh, when they do the counter movement jump. 
So this notion of suboptimal coordination, um, this one we can probably rule out um, largely because if you look at the takeoff posture of the body in both of these jumps, it's largely the same, okay? Meaning I get into about the same pose or the same posture of the body during my takeoff phase of the motion, regardless of which type of jump that I'm doing. Um, similarly, if you control the depth of the squat, if you have me just go down to whatever squat depth makes me do the highest squat jump and then have me do a counter movement jump that I then counter down to that same depth of squat that I did in my squat jump, you know, removing possibly an advantage of the counter movement jump by just ducking down to whatever squat is best for that counter movement and not necessarily best for the squat jump. Um, even then, if you control for that squat depth, um, people still jump higher with the counter movement jump. Um, similarly, when you're doing this push off motion after you get down to the bottom of the squat there, whether you got there dynamically in the kind of movement jump or whether you got there and held it with the squat jump. Um, after that, you then still see the same general sequence of muscle activity. People tend to activate their glutes to get their trunk pointed upright and then activating their quads and their calves in pretty quick succession to push their feet against the ground and get that ground reaction force generated under the center of mass and pushing you upward. We tend to use that same sequence uh, in both the counter movement jump and the squat jump. So suggesting that different kind of coordination of the various like, sequences of motions or sequences of muscle activity in the body um, is not a compelling explanation here for why the counter movement jump is higher. It's about the same sequences, regardless of which scale you look at uh, for the push off phase of both of these jumps. Um, more broadly speaking, I would, uh, I would guess even, and especially in, uh, in most athletes, but uh, particularly in uh, like field sport athletes, um, athletes in sports like uh, basketball or uh, volleyball, or I don't know if you guys play ultimate frisbee. I played ultimate frisbee the other day for the first time in like three years. But I noticed when I was doing that, when you're trying to, you know, box someone out and jump up and get a disc, you do a squat jump, right? Or I used to play a lot of basketball. And when you're trying to get a rebound, you often duck down to kind of stick your hips and stick your butt into the person you're boxing out and do a squat jump to jump up and get the rebound. Okay. So I would, I would guess in, in athletes, especially athletes in certain sports, that a squat jump is a pretty familiar common thing that's, that's a big part of that sport. Or if you're jumping to like do a block at the net in volleyball, you often squat down, get your timing right, and then push against the ground to, to go up like that. Um, if you're doing a spike, then of course that's, that's typically a counter movement jump, but that's a different situation, right? So the squat jump, I think at least, especially for uh, field sport and team sport athletes is a pretty familiar motion for a lot of those athletes. And they nonetheless still jump quite a bit higher when they're allowed to do the counter movement versus the squat. So we can rule this one out as a uh, compelling explanation here for uh, why the counter movement jump is uh, uh, higher than the squat jump. It's not here because of differences or suboptimal coordination um, in the squat jump. Okay, so we're down to two here, two possible theories. We ruled out this first one here. What about this idea of storage and return of elastic strain energy? Um, this is getting at a really important concept in uh, muscle mechanics and human movement, and that's a stretch shortening cycle. Um, this is a really important idea in uh, how people use our muscles in a variety of movements. We do this a lot in uh, walking. We do this a lot in running. We do this a lot in jumping. This is kind of a very common thing that we do in terms of controlling and coordinating our muscles, not just in jumping, but in a lot of movements. Um, a stretch shortening cycle is a movement where your brain activates the muscle and typically as it's activating, you're also moving your body and moving your joints in a way that stretch that muscle. Okay. And then later on, while the muscle is still active and maybe while its activation is ramping down, you then shorten that muscle. Okay. Um, typically the shortening action is when we're doing the actual work on the body that then moves the body as a whole through space. Um, the stretch action is preceding that so that we can do a more, um, I'll just use the term mechanically effective shortening action later on, a more mechanically effective shortening action in terms of generating lots of force or moving the body quickly or powerfully or in, in the right direction or whatever your goal might be. Um, by stretching the muscle as its activation is ramping up, this does two good things. It stretches the muscle, storing elastic strain energy in it, that can then hypothetically get released as strain energy later on in the movement. Um, I've got my very simple muscle model here. If I can get it from under my chair. 
but picture this red fitness band as being like uh, the muscles in your quadriceps when you uh, flex your knee. The more you flex the knee, the more you stretch those quadriceps as you flex, the more strain energy you store in them, and the more strain energy you have to get back as kinetic energy when you then extend the knee and shorten those quadriceps. Okay? So by stretching the muscles in this counter movement part of the jump or in this squatting part of the jump, I store strain energy in them that can then be released in the push off phase of the jump as kinetic energy. Um, also, by stretching these muscles, lengthening them, um, if you think back to that force velocity curve from the muscle mechanics or the muscle uh, level part of class, the tissue level part of class, um, stretching a muscle at a uh, lengthening velocity there puts it up on that eccentric part of its force velocity curve where it can generate um, more force than it could have generated um, if it was, was held isometrically or if it was shortening at a, at a similar velocity. Okay. So we do there see some uh, differences in how the counter movement jump might help people jump higher. Um, but if it does, it's related to that force velocity curve, the dynamic stretching of the muscle when I'm doing the counter movement versus the static stretching of the muscle where I stretch it and then hold it there and that eccentric force velocity effect goes away because it's static and not actively stretching it at an eccentric velocity. Um, regardless of if it's a counter movement jump or if it's a squat jump, I still end up in this squatted posture in the middle here, um, still with my joints in roughly the same posture in both jumps and thus with my muscles stretched to roughly the same length and storing uh, roughly the same amount of elastic strain energy that could feasibly be released uh, later on as kinetic energy. Okay. So possibly an effect here uh, for the force velocity relationship, but that's a separate effect from the, the elastic part, the storage and return of elastic strain energy by stretching the muscles as I squat down here. Um, that's happening in both of these types of jumps, the counter movement jump and the squat jump. So by process of elimination here, we can sort of, and this is kind of just summarizing uh, things that I've just said here for when you're going back and studying, but as you stretch your muscles, you deliver about the same amount of energy in terms of elastic strain energy uh, to your muscles in both the counter movement jump um, and in the squat jump. And you return that energy with a, a similar efficiency, uh, regardless of if you did a squat jump or a, a counter movement jump. So we can kind of rule out uh, greater storage and return of elastic energy in the muscles as, as a compelling explanation here. So ruled out number one, ruled out number two. So by process of elimination, we can kind of accept number three here must be the explanation, but maybe there's a number four, right? Maybe we don't have the right theory here and we shouldn't just accept the one that we haven't ruled out yet. Let's, let's still examine this uh, in isolation here and see if this one has, has some compelling evidence for it. Now recall this notion of the uh, level of muscular force production at the molecular level where we have these cross bridges, these actin filaments that overlap with these myosin filaments. And then the myosin heads grab onto the actin and generate some tension um, that creates the force and through the shortening action of that tension performs the work at the molecular level in muscle. And that then scales up to force and work at the, at the whole muscle level in terms of the tendon pulling on the bone and that scales up to the joint level and the whole body level for actual movement of the body. Um, that process, that process of the cross bridge cycle there, the myosin head grabbing onto the actin, developing tension, pulling on it, detaching, recocking, and grabbing on again in this cyclical fashion, it's a mechanical cycle and it takes time. It doesn't happen instantaneously. So that's a compelling reason here to, to think that maybe by just simply taking a longer amount of time to do the movement, that's how I managed to jump higher with the counter movement jump. There's more time available for cross bridges to cycle, more time for more binding sites on actin to open up, um, more time for more cross bridges to actually form and develop large muscular forces, um, more time to, to stretch the muscles dynamically, eccentrically, and get up on that strong, powerful place on my force velocity curve. Um, so this is a pretty compelling theory, I think, just simply more time available for muscular force production to happen at, at, at all scales of, of muscular force production, whether it's the cellular level or the tissue level or the joint level or whatever, simply more time available for that to happen when you do the longer movement, the counter movement versus the squat jump. So 
number one most compelling reason here, at least I think the best explanation for why people jump higher with the counter movement jump versus the squat jump is more time available for force production. More time with your feet on the ground to generate a large impulse, uh, more time with your feet on the ground to generate large muscle forces, which then result in a large impulse against the ground. Now that may seem a little strange if you're an athlete and you've ever had a coach coach you how to jump and they probably told you to try to explode off the ground, right? Jump fast, jump quickly, you know, really do the movement as, as quickly as you can. Um, that's generally good advice, um, but that's typically advice for doing the best um, counter movement jump. You know, if you're gonna do a counter movement jump anyway, doing it in a ballistic, powerful, explosive fashion is generally the best way to, to jump high like that. Um, it's not saying that you should um, be replacing the counter movement jump with the squat jump or replacing the squat jump with the counter movement jump. Um, it's saying that when the counter movement jump is compared to the squat jump, it tends to take a longer amount of time. But it's not saying you should disregard coaching advice to, to try to do the movement rapidly or try to explode off the ground. It's comparing two wholly separate uh, types of jumps, not, not different ways of doing the same type of jump, like different approaches to, to doing the counter movement jump. Okay, what about this idea of arm swing? Um, how does arm swing make us jump higher? This is a little difficult to kind of wrap our heads around, right? And this is one where, again, if arm swing makes us jump higher, it must be increasing takeoff velocity and vertical impulse, but how exactly? Um, the best theory that I've come across for this one is this idea that my trunk is really heavy. And if I don't get my trunk positioned just right, my jump is gonna be really bad, okay? Um, I'll try and give you another video type demonstration here. If I make my screen big. So typically, the sequence of movements that people will do when they jump, if you slow a jump down to kind of slow motion here, is you'll squat down. And then the first thing you'll do is activate your glutes to get your trunk kind of pointed up right like this. Okay? Then I'll activate my quads and my calves to push myself upward. Um, it's important to get my trunk pointed upright like that so that then when I'm pressing my legs into the ground with my knees and with my ankles, that ground reaction force that I generate is then running straight up through my trunk, like straight up through my center of mass. Okay. Um, let's suppose I didn't do that. Suppose I squatted down like this and didn't get my trunk pointed upright, and then I start generating my ground reaction force. That just kind of pitches me forward, right? So it, it doesn't make very efficient, let's, with the mechanical definition of efficiency there, doesn't make very efficient use of my ground reaction force. It kind of starts tipping me forward rather than pressing me up into the ground or pressing me up into the air if I don't get my trunk pointed up right with that initial burst of glute activity um, in the jump. So what does that have to do with arm swing? Well, the trunk is a big, heavy part of the body. And it takes time and takes considerable effort to move that big heavy trunk around and get it pointed in the right direction at the right time so that you can do a good jump. Um, arm swing, if we consider arms as kind of an overall part of this whole upper body slash trunk part of the body, um, by swinging my arms, this is effectively changing the moment of inertia of my trunk, which could reduce the effort that it takes of my glute muscles to get my trunk extended and get it pointed up in the, up in the air like that. Okay. So by swinging my arms, maybe I can get my trunk pointed where it needs to be quicker or at a better time to make better use of my ground reaction force, or maybe it reduces the effort that it takes for my glutes to get me pointed up in the air. And more of that effort from my glutes can then be uh, dedicated towards pressing my legs into the ground and actually propelling me against gravity like that. Um, that's not proven. That's not a fact as far as I know. That's just kind of my intuition for, for why I think this is helpful. Um, it has been shown that if you jump with or without swinging your arms, uh, this indeed changes the moment of inertia of your trunk. Um, it reduces the velocities that the muscles in the lower leg have to shorten at, allowing them to, to generate greater forces and more power. And from that, again, the muscles end up uh, doing more work and, and more power in terms of delivering energy to the trunk and uh, getting you to jump. Um, why is that exactly? I, again, think it's because chain or swinging the arms um, changes the moment of inertia of the trunk, allowing you to get it pointed upright when you need it and reducing the effort the glutes have to spend to, to pointing it up in the air versus propelling it uh, up against gravity uh, in the air like that. Okay, now, regardless of whether you're doing a squat jump or whether you're doing a counter movement jump, 
um, athletes in general are often interested in training for performance, right? What's the best way to train for maximum jump height? Or if I'm not a very good jumper, how can I train myself to make myself be a better jumper in terms of jump height? And what's the, what's the biomechanical basis for this? Um, jumping is largely about your strength to mass ratio, or your, your kind of mass specific lower limb power. Um, you might guess that somebody who's heavier has a harder time jumping than somebody who's lighter, right? More and more weight to move against gravity. That's generally going to be a more difficult thing to do. Um, once you leave the ground, then it doesn't really matter. When you're airborne, it's all just about takeoff velocity. But of course, a heavier person has to generate larger forces to reach a certain takeoff velocity compared to a light person. Um, the light person will be especially better off if they have a lot of power in their legs, a lot of power in their muscle, uh, pound for pound. And so generally the best jumpers, and this probably isn't surprising, are gonna be people that are relatively light, um, but also have very powerful, strong legs and can generate a lot of work and a lot of force quickly in their lower legs. Okay. Um, if you're lazy in the gym and you wanna know what's the one single muscle group I should exercise to maximize jump height, um, I don't recommend doing that. You should do you know, an overall strength training program. That's probably for the best for a variety of reasons. But if you're lazy and just care about jump height and just wanna do one exercise, what should you do? Uh, probably knee extensions. It's been shown repeatedly in a variety of studies with a variety of different designs that the quadriceps or the strength of the quadriceps muscles is the single most important um, muscle group for, for predicting jump height or for maximizing jump height. Now, this raises an interesting question of if I want to improve jump height, um, is strength training what I should be doing, right? Like if I'm in the off season and coach says, you're not a very good jumper, I want you to work on your jump height for next season, what should I do? Is, is strength training alone enough to do that? Well, if just, just, just simply strengthening my legs or strengthening my quadriceps, is that alone enough to, to get me to improve my jump height? Um, in my own research in biomechanics, I do a lot of computer simulations and, and computer modeling and simulation of human movement. And I like that work. I find it interesting. I find it personally rewarding and technically interesting. Um, it's fairly complex, like technical side of it work. And it can often be difficult to connect it to an obvious, like practical, clinical, real world take home application sometimes. Um, this study here is one of my favorite studies in biomechanics on computer modeling and simulation, because I think it has a really clear and really compelling practical take home message in terms of what athletes should take away uh, from this study in terms of learning from it, even though it was a study done with a computer model, not a study done on, on actual human participants. Um, here, they were examining with a computer model the effects of muscle strengthening on a vertical jump height. Here, they were studying a squat jump, but this would also probably extend to counter movement jumps as well. Um, in the study, they created a computer model of the body, of the, the trunk here, and the hip, and the knee, and the ankle, and the foot, and then all the main muscle groups here that are important for jumping. Each one of these kind of spring like uh, strand looking things with these labels here. Um, those are models of those particular muscle groups, the hamstrings and the glutes, the plantar flexors, quadriceps, et cetera here, um, capturing all those uh, tissue level elements of muscular force production that we talked about in the muscle lectures, the force length relationship, the force velocity relationship, uh, the time course of activation, the, the stretchiness of the tendon, all those things that we talked about uh, in, in the muscle lectures on class. Um, the way that you get this thing to jump is you have a hypothetical nervous system that's not shown here that delivers excitation signals to these muscles. Okay. Um, the muscles then respond by developing force and producing moments at these joints. Um, those moments press the feet into the ground and generate ground reaction forces and cause the model to jump up into the air. Okay. Um, you then use some computer programs, some computer algorithms to optimize the timing of the maximum bursts of excitation that the nervous system sends to these muscles to get it to jump as high as possible. And so it's kind of a, a roundabout way of teaching the muscle to optimize the coordination of its neuromuscular control to get it to, to maximize its jump height. So they did that simulation with the model here, which is what's shown in this trace of stick figures. It's squat jump from the start here to its takeoff posture there. Um, they then took some measurements of who they called well-trained volleyball players. I think this was the current uh, Dutch Olympic men's volleyball team. So some pretty skilled athletes and good jumpers here probably and compared their motions on the left to traces of the model's motion on the right. And they, they came out pretty well here, pretty good just eyeball comparison. Um, the model jumped to a height of 0.4 meters above the ground. 
and the subjects, the human volleyball players, on average jumped to 0.45 meters off the ground. Okay, so pretty, pretty reasonable comparison here of this model um, optimizing these muscle excitations to jump as high as possible. Um, it generally did the jump in a uh, pattern of motion and sequences of muscle activity that were similar to what the humans did and jumped to a, a comparable height as the human subjects. Okay, so this gives us some confidence that this is a realistic model and we can do kind of virtual experiments with this model and draw inferences from those results on actual humans, even though the model, of course, is not an actual human. So then what did they do? Um, they then took the knee extensors, the quadriceps muscles in the model, um, increased their strength by 20%, which would be a pretty good uh, increase in uh, muscle strength. And not that squatting, like, you know, barbell squatting is all about quadriceps, but quadriceps are a, a big component of barbell squatting, of course. Um, imagine if your squat is like 200 pounds and then you suddenly increase it to 240 pounds, that would be a 20% increase. And that, that's a pretty substantial increase in, in strength for, for that particular movement and those, those particular muscles involved. So plus 20% here is pretty major strength in, uh, in, in a muscle, pretty major increase in muscle strength. Most athletes would be very pleased with such an outcome from a, a strength training program. Um, so here on the left, they took the quadriceps muscles in the model um, increased them by 20% in terms of increasing their strength, the max force they could produce. Um, but they didn't re-optimize the muscle excitations. They didn't reteach the model to uh, jump as high as possible. They simply used the old sequence of muscle excitations from the previous weaker model. So they made it stronger, but they didn't have it practice. They didn't have it relearn to take advantage of that new strength through practicing the coordination of the muscles and the coordination of the parts of the body to use that new strength. They simply just assumed that the old muscle excitations would work fine here. And it didn't. Okay? You see, even with the 20% increase in strength, the model decreased its jump height from 40 centimeters to 31 centimeters, which is a pretty big decrement in jump height. And you can see here, it kind of looks like what I was doing when I forgot to tip my trunk up into the air, right? Kind of looks like it didn't get its trunk pointed up right in time and kind of wasted some of its ground reaction force when it was jumping. Um, in order to actually jump higher, it was necessary to increase the strength of the muscles, but also to let the model practice with that new strength, learn to re-optimize the timing of the muscle coordination, the neuromuscular control, the timing of when certain muscles are maximally activated in, in this push-off motion in order to jump higher. Okay? And if they did that, then they saw about a 10% increase in maximum jump height in the model uh, from that 20% increase in, in the maximum strength of those quadriceps muscles. So take home message there is that strength alone is not enough, at least for increasing jump height, if you want to increase your jump height, it's not enough just to increase the strength of the quadriceps or the strength of any, any particular muscle. You've also got to practice. You've got to learn how to take advantage of that new strength and reteach yourself basically how to jump, not from scratch, but how to subtly adjust the timing of your muscle excitations and the kind of subconscious pattern of motion that we use to take advantage of that new strength, Re, you know, kind of the motor learning process and adjusting your multi-segment uh, coordination of the body. Um, this calls into what I think is the best interview in the history of the NBA. So I might be dating myself a little bit here. I don't know if you guys still know who Allen Iverson is. He's been retired for a number of years, but when I was like big into the NBA, when I was you guys' age, a college student about 20 years ago or so, he's of course one of the best players in the league. And at the time of this interview, he was the reigning MVP of the league. And he was getting some, uh, some rough comments in this interview from some sportscasters on how there were rumors going around that he was skipping practice or was just kind of dogging it at practice. And he, he just says the word practice here like a thousand times in this interview and won't, won't shut up about practice. He's obviously very perturbed about uh, the idea that, that practice is, an, is as important as the games. Um, that's kind of the, the reputation that he got from this interview, that he is just kind of blowing off practice and is saying practice isn't all that important. It's all about the games and I perform well in the games. Um, at, his, at his induction speech to the Hall of Fame some years later, um, he then clarified that he was greatly misinterpreted uh, in this interview. And maybe that's just hindsight. Maybe that's just him trying to make it sound a little bit rosier than it, than it did in, in real time here. Um, but what he was saying, how he was misinterpreted here, was that he wasn't saying that practice isn't important. 
Um, he, and I won't quote his, his language that he used in that interview. It's, it's not appropriate for, for a class here. Um, but what he was saying was, even though I'm Allen Iverson, even though I'm the reigning MVP of the league, you know, objectively the best player in the league by, by whoever awards such things, even I have to practice. Of course I have to practice. Nobody can be that good, that successful in their sport, just based on talent alone, it's necessary to practice. And I think this, this study highlights that nicely. Doesn't matter how much you train your strength, you gotta learn to take advantage of that new strength for a skilled practiced motion like, like vertical jumping or especially something like playing basketball. Okay, um, last little bit I'll add here is that if you're interested in what biomechanics is like in classes beyond this one, um, we often get into developing these computer models and learning how to use them. Um, if you have a program on your computer called MATLAB and you know how to use it, um, you can go to this link here and you can download some codes that I use in one of my graduate classes for doing these, these types of simulations. And you can fiddle around here with the, the different timing of the muscle activity for the glutes and for the quadriceps and play around with the muscle strengths and, and see how high you can get this thing to jump. Um, if you don't know what MATLAB is or don't have any idea what, what all this stuff is, then, then don't worry about it. This isn't for an exam or anything, it's just for fun. Uh, but if you feel like taking a look at that and you're familiar with MATLAB, feel free to download it and, and play around with it and, and see how high you can get this thing to jump. Okay, that is it for today. We will see you on Wednesday.